done. Um, and most of our, uh, actually all of our uh, recordings will be on our past seminar page uh, at hmsc.oregonstate.edu slash past seminars. And uh, that should be posted in the chat. Uh, some quick announcements. Next week's seminar on April 21st will be a fully remote seminar uh, when Amelia Munson, a postdoc at the University of Glasgow, uh, talks to us about growing up is a hot, scary mess. Understanding how experience shapes variation and consistency in fish behavior. So that should be exciting. Uh, we also have on that same day an HMSC Science on Tap. Uh, that will be happening that evening at 6 p.m. with our very own Mauricio Cantor with the Marine Mammal Institute at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. Um, Mauricio will present a public virtual talk entitled, drum roll, Inventive Feeding Tactics Shape Dolphin Societies. Uh, would also like to highlight that he'll be teaching a new summer course here, uh, a short course for three weeks, um, that is titled Social Ecology of Marine Megafauna. So we're really excited about that. If you need info or log into, uh, if you need info or log in details for this or any of our events, please log on to the HMSC homepage and scroll to the bottom for a calendar of events with all the details. Now, without any more time for today, let me uh, let um, Taylor Chapel introduce our guest speaker. Taylor, you want to take it? All right, can everybody hear me now? Can you hear me there, right, Yi Chung? Yes, we can hear you. Hear you. Okay, great. Thank you, Kyle. Um, sorry about that. There was a little confusion about microphones. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, thank you, Kyle, for coming to talk with us. Uh, Kyle is a, uh, a new research associate um, at OSU. He's here with Sarah Henkel and myself. Um, and Kyle is, uh, he's a sensory cognitive ecologist. Uh, and so I'm sure today we'll be learning about some of the cool techniques and studies that he's uh, been using on these different animals, um, largely lasmobranchs and some other teleos fishes. Uh, Kyle has basically bounced uh, from coast to coast. He started um, in California doing his, his bachelor's, went over to Florida to do, wait, did I get that right? Um, no. Then Am I backwards? Did my bachelor's in Miami, master's in Fullerton, PhD in Florida. And now back here. <laughs> yeah. For a, oh, yeah. Uh, and a postdoc in the Midwest. So don't forget that. So Kyle's had a, a, a long career of going back and forth, but we finally got him back out to the, to the West Coast, um, where Kyle's going to be working on a lot of uh, work with marine renewables and the effect that they have on different fishes. Hopefully, he'll touch on that uh, a little bit later. But um, I know I'm excited. I'm sure all of you are excited to see this super rad um, uh, talk that Kyle's going to give. So with that, welcome, Kyle. Thank you all for being here and uh, looking forward to your talk. <clears throat> Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, everybody, to come or before coming to the talk. Uh, it's kind of nice to be in person, uh, right? It's been a few years. So uh, without any further ado, I'll, I'll get started. So as, ah, shite. <laughs> Oops, hold on. Maybe I got to do this. There we go. As Taylor said, a sensory ecologist, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, I'm really interested in how animals acquire, so they detect, acquire, process, and then actually respond to information in their environment. And this information comes from a variety of cues, whether it's biotic or abiotic, and you can use a variety of sensory modalities to actually acquire different sorts of cues. <clears throat> You can look at a variety of different things. You can start to look at the, the morphology. You can look at the physiological function of a system. I'm gonna talk mostly about behavior today. And in particular, what are the anthropogenic impacts? Like what is the stuff that we do as humans that impact the world around us? In particular, how animals can start to, uh, how, well, how they can make a living and how they can actually uh, interpret and detect these cues around us. <clears throat> and I'm going to be talking about cryptic cues or cryptic senses 
And the reason we use that term is because it's stuff that we as humans don't necessarily have a natural appreciation for, like the detection of electromagnetic fields. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start off with a little bit of a rant. Um, so there's, speaking of which electromagnetic fields, we have a classic thing of the electromagnetic or the electrosensory system of the Lazarbrinks or Kondrickians and people always say, these are the ampullae of Lorenzini. And I'm here to tell you that is a complete load of crap. These are actually technically the pores that lead to the ampullae of Lorenzini. The ampullae of Lorenzini are actually located subdermally, sometimes several tens of centimeters away. So I like to think about it like this. We've all seen Harry Potter, right? And if you haven't, what's wrong with you? It's actually, it's okay. We'll, we'll have a support group later. Think of it this way. So you've got, a, you've got a pore, you've got a canal, and then you've got the ampullae of Lorenzini actually down, down subdermally. You would never, oh, where does the magic always happen? It happens in Hogwarts, right? It doesn't happen in platform nine and four and three quarters. Platform nine and four and three quarters is these little pores right here. You have to take the Hogwarts Express down the canal to Hogwarts to actually learn how to be a magician. So that's actually where everything's happening. Those uh, electrosensory cells are subdermally in the ampullae themselves. And this is what it looks like in cartoon form and in real life. Interestingly enough, they're, actually, they're innervated by the anterior uh, uh, root of the lateral line nerve. So that means it's actually closely related to the lateral line. There's just something that all fishes have and amphibians as well. So if we kind of zoom out and take a, an overhead view of uh, a shark brain, <clears throat> a generalized shark brain, we'll see, and we take this cross section here through the midbrain, and we look at that cross section, we'll see that this ampullae of Lorenzini innervate the dorsal octavolateral nucleus, which is also right next to the medial octavolateral nucleus. That's where the lateral line innervates. And of course, the auditory centers are right there as well. So what unifies this whole system, the octavolateralis system, is basically sensory hair cells. So the reason that you can hear me now is because you've got hair cells in your inner ear and those transduce mechanical stimuli into something that your brain can interpret. Electroreceptors are really just a derived sensory hair cell. This is how it all kind of works in a very over, uh, broad overview. If you have your canal here and your pore up top, it's filled with an, uh, an electrically conductive glycoprotein gel. What winds up happening is you get this accumulation of, of charge at the pore and it moves protons up and down the uh, glycoprotein gel. What this winds up doing is you get a net negative charge in the lumen of the ampulla, which allows those sensory hair cells there that are innervated by those primary afferents to detect these uh, electrical stimuli. And there, so there's the electroreceptors themselves and the support cells that kind of take care of them, maintain their health. Interestingly, interestingly enough about sensory hair cells and electroreceptors, <clears throat> they're called tonic receptors, which means they're constantly firing. This gives them, so there's constantly neurotransmitter being released, boop, 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 boop. And what winds up happening is this allows them to be incredibly sensitive receptors, such that if the, if the cell experiences a net positive charge, you actually inhibit the firing rate of these electroreceptors, but if you give them a net negative charge, it increases the firing rate. So that's how they code for the polarity of the stimulus and also the intensity of it. So you get more firing with a stronger stimulus. Really briefly, this is again, a really big sort of gross generalization. Uh, here's your electroreceptor with the apical end. So that's the part inside the lumen there at the top. And you've got your little kind of cilium there, which is kind of a, a holdover from this hair cell origins. And you get this accumulation of charge. Well, what it winds up doing is it eventually opens voltage gated calcium channels. The more charge, the more, uh, the more uh, calcium flows down its concentration gradient and into the cell. At some point, now there's a balancing act going on with actually efflux of potassium ions, but what you get is this wave you depolarize the cell or the membrane, I should say, and you get this wave of depolarization that goes from the apical down to the basal end. And what this winds up doing is eventually more calcium uh, channels get open. This allows calcium to flow into the cell at the basal end, which allows neurotransmitter to be released into the synapse. So those of you that are uh, on 
uh, antidepressants, sometimes SSRIs. We're talking, this is kind of the mechanism here is what's going on is this whole neurotransmitter release actually across the synaptic cleft. So this gets reuptake and then gets converted to a signal that the brain can eventually inter uh, interpret through those primary afferents. One interesting distinction about electroreceptors compared to the hair cells that you're using right now to, to listen, there's no efferent innervation. In other words, there's no central, there's no connection of the circuit from the central nervous system back to the sensory hair cell. So these are just entirely passive receptors with no active modulation by the central nervous system. What's the primary function of this sensory modality? Well, it's predation. In a uh, it's basically used to detect prey. And so that's what's going on here with this great hammerhead. And this poor little stingray is probably not gonna last too much longer. As you can see, it's actually being, uh, it's being chased down by the hammerhead itself. Stingrays bury themselves in the substrate and they're visually cryptic, but they're not electrically cryptic. <clears throat> so this is a short range sensory modality. It only operates over about 30 or 40 centimeters because these signals decay really, really rapidly. Again, they're super um, sensitive. So we're talking about, at least in what we've known so far, is we're looking at about a nanovolt per centimeter is at this level of sensitivity. And if we do kind of a gross generalization, it's imagine taking, uh, you know, those, those nine volt batteries, the square ones that nobody really uses except for smoke alarms or whatever. And you take one pole, put it in New York and take the other pole and put it in London. If you were able to detect the voltage drop across those two, those two electrodes, then that's on the order of magnitude of what we're talking about here. So incredibly sensitive <clears throat> at detecting these bioelectric fields. So here's gonna be rant number two. A lot of times if you see on uh, Discovery Channel sort of stuff, they'll say that sharks and rays, uh, it's their sixth sense or whatever, and they're detecting muscle contractions like the heartbeat of their prey complete, nope, not, <laughs> that's not the case at all. What it is, because those, those signals are, are really well insulated, they could never de actually detect those. The electric field that animals are producing is from ion exchange of the gills. Because remember, these guys are in a marine environment, so as they eat, as they drink, they have an excess of ions that they have to get rid of. So they get rid of mostly monovalent ions and stuff at the, at the, the gills divalent and things like through the, the kidneys or the rectal gland. And so you had this constant efflux of ions, which generates a standing electric field. So that's called the DC current, direct current. But when we're talking about vertebrates, you get the mechanics of ventilation. So in and out and in and out. So that modulates that a, uh, DC current into an AC signal. So it becomes sinusoidal. And that's really what these animals are queuing in on, really weak, electric fields that are modulated at about, you know, maybe 20 Hertz or less, anywhere from one to 20 Hertz. And this is a really cool system because it's functional before the animals are even born. So if we have a little baby skate that's still in its egg as it's being, uh, you know, as it's kind of sitting there developing, they tend to move their tail and, you know, to exchange uh, water to metabolic waste and this other stuff. And if you give them a little, uh, electric stimulus that mimics that of a predator, because predators and prey produce these, these fields, they start to get quiet. So they're kind of like Bambi in the headlights, and they get really, really quiet, and they become actually electrically cryptic, which is pretty cool. So that's another function. Uh, you can also use this to detect conspecific. So it's been shown that stingrays, uh, males during the mating season, will find buried females. So they'll cue in on these females, and if she's feeling it, they might go out on a date later, but if she's not, she takes off and hangs out with her girlfriends and they laugh at it for being such a fool. So there's also another function too, which is not very well studied. So in skates, there's modified electric, or I'm sorry, there's an, a weakly electric organ, which is just modified uh, muscle tissue. And in the presence of conspecifics, they generate these species specific signals that they rethink they used to communicate, but nobody's really studied this surprisingly. So each signal or each characteristic signal is, is species specific. And if you take away their friends, they don't have anybody to talk to and they just kind of go quiet unless they're only children like me and then we still do talk to ourselves. So it doesn't really matter. Well, really what I'm gonna to talk to you about for the rest of this is detection of the Earth's magnetic field. 
We know that electroreceptors can actually respond to changes in magnetic fields. We don't necessarily know if this is the mechanism that Elazo ranks use to detect the geomagnetic field, but we think it's probably there. At least there's evidence saying that that might be. And why is this interesting to me? Well, it's because of migration. I think it's really cool when you see a whole bunch of animals going from one spot to another. And so you can put a tag on an animal and then watch it go from one spot to another. So this is a, a migration of black tip sharks off Southeast Florida. And we could put tags on these animals and watch them go up and down the East Coast. But the question I always had was the one they asked in Finding Dory, how do the animals know where to go? That's the really, to me, it's like, as I'm talking to my cat, which I usually do, I'm like, Walter, Bubba, what are you thinking right now? You know, it's like, it's like that concerned parent, you know? It's the same thing. It's like, how do you know where you're at? How do you know where you want to go? If you're going to migrate or navigate from point A to point B, you need two things. You need to know where you're at relative to where you want to go. So you need to know your location and you need to be able to update that regularly. <clears throat> Secondly, you need to know which direction to go to get to, your to get to your goal. So you need to have some sort of sense of direction or a compass. And you can get both of these from the geomagnetic field. One's a little more intuitive for us. I think we understand how compasses work. The sense of location is a little different. So we'll talk about that here right now. We think the geomagnetic field is generated by the Earth's molten core. So it's iron and nickel and all sorts of good things. And it, the field emanates from the North Magnetic Pole, which is actually in the South Geographic Pole. And it is a vector quantity. So it goes out into space, comes back into uh, there at the North Pole. So you get these field lines. Remember when you guys had, had barred magnets and you put iron filings and stuff on it as a kid and stuff in science? Same sort of principle. You can see the field lines there. But remember, what are the, what's, what's the two properties of a vector? Does anybody remember? Direction and magnitude, right? Yeah, see, now that I'm in person, I can actually do the whole teacher mode and sit there and go, we're going to wait until somebody actually answers this. But that's, yeah, so that's the whole point of all the little cartoon uh, arrows here. There's a direction and a magnitude. So just looking at this, you can tell that the Earth's magnetic field is strongest at the poles and weakest at the magnetic equator. And also that angle changes predictably with latitude. But it's, so at the poles, it's orthogonal to the surface of the Earth. So this is called, again, inclination angle, but it's with the opposite orientation, whether in the South Pole or the North Pole. And then it gets parallel at the surface of the Earth at the magnetic equator. So if you can pick up on either of these cues, you can get a good sense of your latitude. And if we map that out, so here's what an intensity map looks like with all the isolines there you can know where you are, sort of relative north and south. You can either use that or inclination angle. Again, the angle of the field changes predictably with latitude. If you realize, what, what if you can actually detect both and distinguish both? This is when it actually gets better because if you overlay those, you see that you can get a more precise sense of your location. This is analogous to our latitude and longitude. So you can get a sense of longitude. It's a little wonky and it's not quite as perfect as our orthogonally arranged system, but you can still do it. And that's what I was really curious about. Can Elazar Branks detect these two cues and potentially use them to get a sense of their location? So I was in Florida and I chose the yellow stingray because it's really bloody adorable. As you can see, this little guy, the little pup in the upper right hand corner, literally was the size of my hand. And they're just, <laughs> <laughs> they're just are super cute. Um, and so, but they don't really respond to any of these magnetic fields. If I give them a magnetic stimulus, they just kind of sit there and they don't really do much. So if there's no natural response, what's our next best thing? Well, we have to kind of condition them. We have to use behavioral conditioning to see if they can actually do this. So what it wind up doing is if this is your ambient field with a particular orientation and magnitude, if I change that, keeping them the, uh, the orientation the same, the inclination angle, but making it stronger, how do I know if they can detect that? Well, at the same time, I give them a tactile stimulus. In other words, I kind of poke, poke, pokey poke right at the base of the tail. Nobody really likes that, especially the stingrays. And what they wind up doing is they just skedaddle and shuttle across the tank. You do this enough and you can demonstrate whether or not they can actually detect that stimulus because you need to be able to detect the change in magnetic field intensity 
as well as the anticipate the becoming mechanical stimulus. So if we give them just a magnetic field stimulus, will they shuttle across the tank? I don't know, let's see and find out. So this was actually my favorite yellow stingray. Yes, I know it's a black one. And that's probably why he was, he was a black morph. So he's just hanging out in the field. See that red LED at the top? That means the field is active and boom. He's like, nope, not gonna get poked, not today. So this is a pretty good indicator that they can detect that change in magnetic field intensity. What about inclination angle? Can they do that as well? So you get a different group of individuals, you go through the same sort of training procedure. This is what it might look like. You just flip the orientation or the angle that uh, upwards in this case. And then we sort of see, do they behave the same? So again, different individuals. She's just sitting there in the corner, minding her own business, a different light. She's, and there she goes. So you do this a whole bunch of times and you can start to generate learning curves and then you know how well they start to perform. And just like being in school, at some point you pass the class. And it's the same thing here. Once you get above the line and there's enough, you do it repeatedly, fine, you, you pass. So they can, they can detect both changes in intensity and inclination angle, and they can distinguish between the two as well. Different series of experiments, but they can actually tell the difference between them. So this was a really good indicator that they can use the Earth's magnetic field as a sense of, you know, to get that sort of map sense, to get that sense of their location. And this has been subsequently demonstrated by a friend of mine, uh, Brian Keller at Florida State, who actually had a really cool paper come out in Current Biology last year, where you can actually take, uh, they took bonnet head sharks, little pop, or not pups, but juveniles, and you can flip the magnetic signature and make them think that they've been displaced 500 kilometers away and see if they reorient. It's a really cool paper. I suggest you check it out. So there's the map sense, but what about the direction? Having a map is great, but you need to know which way to go. Bugs Bunny was always showing us that. And for those of you that were born, you know, maybe before the 90s, you might have actually seen some of these cartoons. But he was always, should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque, right? Remember that? He had a really poor sense of direction. Well, again, since magnetic field polarity is a really good indicator of direction, we can see if maybe they can detect changes in field polarity. So what we did is I actually put stingrays in a maze. Yep, I actually did create a maze and aligned it here with the magnetic field. So they would start down here in the south and they would head north towards the intersection of the maze. And once they got there, I would change the direction of the field. So in this case, north now goes to the left. So east becomes north. And then if I'm training this guy to use that and he makes the correct choice, instead of poking him, I give him a food reward. So everybody knows stingrays like pizza. And so that's what I would use. Actually, my cat really likes pizza too. And so do I, interestingly enough, like father, like son. But you don't want them to cue into just tear, turning left. You want to flip-flop it randomly. So you do it to the right too. So again, you want to train these animals to do the same sort of uh, performance criterion. <laughs> so you can train them again with, with uh, north or south. It doesn't really matter. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. So, uh, you know, because marine science and we're all on a budget, clearly I was uh, getting all my materials at Home Depot and creating my mazes. As you can see, very high tech. As my little friend comes in there, she's sampling the thing. She's like, oh, which way do I go? Okay, I think I go to the left to get my food. And she does. And she gets her food reward. And again, so you can generate more of these silly little learning curves and stuff, and you can start to track their performance. So yes, they can use north and south. So that tells us they probably have some sort of polarity compass. Really cool thing is you can actually reverse train them. So you can flip it up. You can give them mixed messages, like a really bad parent. And you can start to say like, yes means no, and no means yes. And they'll learn it even faster. So this is actually a really interesting potential uh, example of maybe some flexibility in their behavioral constructs. So we think they've got this, you know, maybe this bi-coordinate map and this polarity-based compass. And this is really interesting. So this is starting to tie us into the reason why I came here to OSU. Why does this really matter? So if you have your stingray and he wants to migrate up, you know, back to home, that's actually really cool and all, but what if you're putting, uh, there's, you know, we have this thing called climate change, which yeah, it's real. And as you're generating uh, this offshore or this, uh, off, this energy offshore, 
everybody has to have air conditioning and refrigeration and all that. So we run that high voltage electricity through cables along the seafloor. Well, as these cables are, they have this, uh, all this electricity going through them, they also generate magnetic artifacts. And the thought is, is this maybe a barrier to navigation, especially for benthic species? We're not really sure, nobody's really figured it out. And we need to kind of look at a lot of different species because this little guy here is just anecdotal evidence. So see his reaction. So remember how I told you that the stingrays, there was no natural reaction when I changed any of those magnetic parameters? This guy actually hates it. And this was, he would never experience it ever before. So you have to do your due diligence just because you figure out something with one species doesn't necessarily mean it applies to all. <clears throat> So we're gonna do a really awkward transition and go from Florida to the Midwest. So I had a lot of fun in grad school, got to do a lot of really cool stuff, played a joke on my parents and said, and said oh God, look, I missed my finger. Clearly that's ketchup, right? You guys can see, I mean, why would I miss my middle finger? Like, come on, but it's really ketchup, but they took it serious. So I actually felt bad. <laughs> so I tried to look for something safer. That's the awkward joke. Because now I'm transitioning to Telios' uh, model species here. Yeah, this is how I keep it cool. It's the Ganges nano shark. It's not a zebrafish. It's, I'm here to tell you that you know it's we've we had a little talk and it's been it's been changed. So everything you know, but it's actually been a really I gained a, a big appreciation for model species and there's some really think, cool things you can learn. So I was actually looking at the lateral line in these animals, and so there's a variety. So you you can you're familiar with the lateral line. Hopefully, maybe you've seen it. You can see all the pores and stuff. There's two different kinds of neuromasts that are located either subdermally in canals or superficially along the body. Just real briefly, there are two different types of submodalities. So here in the canal, you see the, the neuromasts with all the sensory hair cells, the kind of cilium, the cupula that actually uh, uh, moves with the water flow. And as you have water flowing from left to right, what winds up happening is those neuromasts that are in the canal experience a difference in pressure. You've got a side of high and low pressure. Well, if you go back to the first principles of physics, which I'm sure everybody remembers all this, in changes in pressure, there's actually an acceleration component. So these are primarily acceleration detectors. So they, they detect the acceleration of water flow, whereas those that are on the surface are primarily velocity detectors. This is important because the larval zebrafish that I use, which were about a week old, only have superficial neuromass at this particular point in their development. Again, if we look at their morphology, just from, uh, you see, it's very similar to the electrosensory system. I said it's basically a sister system to that, to the electrosensory system. And they have very similar, they go into those uh, org, uh, nuclei in the brain that I talked about earlier. But again, there's no electrosensory system so there's no the dorsal octavolateral nucleus for those electroceptors to, to go into. What are some of the behaviors that are mediated by the lateral line? There's quite a few. There's foraging, of course. There is communication with conspecifics. There's imaging your environment, especially this is really good for blind cavefish, avoiding predators, going to school with your mates, and then of course, uh, orientation to water flow, which is called rheotaxis. There's two basic kinds of rheotaxis behavior. And if you choose to orient into the flow, that's called positive rheotaxis. Whereas if you orient with the flow, that's called negative rheotaxis. This is, a, this is a, an example of a multimodal behavior. So it's not primarily mediated by the lateral line. There are also visual cues, tactile cues, vestibular cues that are brought into this. But at this stage in their development, vestibular cues are not really much of an issue. And we're gonna have, we're gonna find a way to deal, or I'm gonna show you a way that you can deal with the visual cues. Cause I wanted to kind of figure out what's the whole point of all this next little stage in, in my, uh, my talk here, I'm just talking about my, my previous postdoc there in, at Washington University in St. Louis <clears throat> was, you know, we're gonna try and figure out what does the lateral line contribute to rheotaxis behavior. So you do kind of a sensory knockout or sensory deprivation studies. And also wanted to start playing around with machine learning. Because machine learning, as I'm starting to see, it's kind of like donuts. Donuts are almost the perfect food and they can do damn near anything. Machine learning is kind of the same thing. It can do just about anything. And I think it's really gonna be the way to go for uh, future uh, behavioral analysis. So again, what we're, we're, we're gonna do is we're actually gonna knock out the lateral line system. 
<clears throat> so here's a lateral line under uh, confocal microscopy in an intact animal. You can ablate it by exposing them to copper sulfate or neomycin. Neomycin is just an antibiotic drug, aminoglycoside, and it kills those sensory hair cells. The reason why zebrafish are actually used, I was in a clinical department, otolaryngology, so that's a fancy word for ENTs, ear, nose, throat. These cells regrow in fish and amphibians, whereas when we get hearing damage, they don't regrow. So they think this could be a model for human hearing loss, or at least how to fix it. So how did I do this? So I, I would, you know, treat the animals with antibiotics or have the animal, and then I would, I created a 3D print. So this is kind of like a little racetrack. It's probably about this big. It was a 3D print of translucent plastic, a little boat motor up top. So there's this thing, RC, radio controlled yachts actually exist, which is weird to me, but they have little bow thruster motors and that's what I used in there. So I kind of like MacGyvering some of this stuff. It's kind of fun. So this is not too, so this generates our water flow. I have my animal, uh, isolated in this arena so he can't or she can't move. And then I would film this in the dark under infrared light to eliminate those visual cues. So when we film it from up above with an IR sensitive camera, you get a bunch of videos. And what you can really do, this is where the machine learning stuff starts to come in. So after the fact, you can take videos of, of fish performing real taxes and extract some frames. So you have maybe half a dozen to 10 videos. You take maybe 20 frames out of each. And what you do after the fact is you start to label body parts. So think about, you know, Andy Serkis, the, the uh, actor who played Gollum in Lord of the Rings. When he did all that, he wore a, mo a mocap suit. So it was like spandex with a bunch of markers on it so they could digitally recreate Gollum later. You don't have to do that now. You can do it without actually putting markers on the animals. You can do it after the fact. You just need to create a model. So what you do is, oops, I, I go back and I, mo I labeled on all of those frames, seven different body parts, eyes, swim bladder, four points along the tail, and then put all that into a machine and let it go. A couple hundred thousand iterations, maybe in, uh, a million, and you get this model. And the really great thing is with the model, you can actually take naive videos and run them through there and it will track the animals, those body parts throughout the, the course of the experiment. It's really, really cool. So what you get is at the end of this, you get you know, a video and it can actually be labeled. You get a CSV file with a bunch of coordinates of all the body parts, X, Y, and Z. Sometimes if you wanna do three dimensions, it's fine. You can even do this stuff live. So there's actually live analysis. It's, it's actually good and really, really cool. And you take all this data and you put it into another program, which is called Simba, which is uh, created by a colleague of mine at the University of Washington. So Simba is not, you know, the Lion King Simba, but it means it's an acronym for simple behavioral analysis. And this is how we would use, or we would use another program to actually annotate real taxis behaviors. It's a very similar process. You go through those example videos, label your real taxis and go, here's what it is, here's what it is, and you create a new machine model. So what winds up happening, so this is what it looks like. And, okay. So this is a teensy weensy, like, five millimeter long fish. And you can see those little colored points are following it along. And we would record the, the fish for 10 seconds under no flow. So they're not performing Rio Texas here, but he's swimming around, enjoying his life for the most part, all seven days of it. And now here comes the water flow. It goes from top to bottom and you can see it's actually tracking the fish. Now he's performing Rio Texas, positive Rio Texas. So we had to have some limits on that. So we have, okay, the water flow has to be on. The animal has to be oriented at zero degrees, plus or minus 45. And then also some other conditions to, so this is for the machine to actually pick out the behaviors. So we've got the, the body angle. We've also got movement of the tail and forward translation of the body. So these are some of the parameters that we would use. All this stuff gets stuck into yet another model. And here we go again. So it's the same sort of process. We're just doing it again and again and again. And you get this, and then at the end of it, you get spit out Rio Texas behavior. You can, they're really cool. So with my PhD, I had small sample sizes of like seven or eight animals. Now I would have 700. That's actually one of the really nice things about model species is you can get tons and tons of data. And now that you've tracked the body parts, you can start to look at a whole host of parameters. So linear movement components, like how much you move, velocity, acceleration, great. 
You can look at angular components like the angle of the body throughout time, or actually you can bin it over time. You can look at the angular variance of the animals as well. And then you start to look at the actual data of it. So this is what's really interesting. So remember, I said there was under no flow. We would do this as baseline data. So here's your control animals with, control animals with an intact lateral line. They have no natural orientation. Each one of those teeny tiny little dots is the average body angle for 248 individuals over that first 10 seconds of no flow. And you would see that, that it's the same distribution. There's a uniform distribution of animals, regardless of treatment or not. So this doesn't really affect their baseline behavior. But what you start to see is under flow, this is what's really interesting. They can all perform rheotexas. So the, those vectors there, that's the mean of the entire group, but you do start to see some difference. Even the copper sulfate and the neomycin fish, they can still orient into the water flow, but the distributions do look a little bit different if you squint really hard. But you can actually start to pick this up. After you've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these videos, you start to actually see things with your eye. And yeah, the stats bear it out that there are differences in the distributions, but how do you put your finger on it? This is where the machine learning stuff really comes in handy because you're like, I know something's not right, but I just can't really describe what it is. And this allows you to do that. First off, if we look at the spatial use of the animals, under no flow, they're all kind of the same. They use, they mostly like the edge. It's kind of called figma taxis for the most part. That just means they just like to go around the periphery, exploring their boundaries. But under flow, you'll see the controls here on the left, the bottom left, they actually occupy the forward part of the arena, right there at the source of the flow. Whereas those that have the lateral line ablated are kind of blown up back against the back grate. They can still perform the behavior, but they're kind of like knocked back. So imagine like you've had a few beers and your behavior just gets, you could still sort of walk a straight line, kind of with a little bit of help. Imagine it's a little bit like this. Something's just not, not quite right with these guys. What about all those other parameters that I said, the, the linear and angular movement stuff? Well, you can start to track this through time. So here's just like a time series of relative movement, the mean body angle, how it changes through time and the angular variance. Sorry, it's a little tough to see the blue right there, but it's, it's, uh, that's the, the copper sulfate fish. It's a little dark for the screen. What you do is if you remove the noise from all this time series data, you start to look at underlying trends. And it's a little bit tough to see here, but you start to actually see some things coming out. With the mean body angle, the actual, the control animals, they can start to, at zero degrees, that dotted line right in the middle of the graph there, they're actually able to quickly track back to zero degrees and into that flow. Whereas the others, they're kind of always a little bit off and a little bit to the left. <clears throat> Same with the angular variance. There's actually differences in the variance. The control animals actually have a lot more variation in their, uh, their angle. So it's almost as if they're sampling from different angles and they can, because they have the intact lateral line and they can start to make more minute movements, more effective movements. If you look at even not just the overall trends, but the changes at any given second. So you can start to really like go kind of uh, down the rabbit hole or down the rabbit hole. This is called periodicity. So this is like average fluctuation. You actually start to see changes there too. So I'll blow this up. Relative to the controls, the copper sulfate fish, they make bigger changes in their linear movements. Whereas the neomycin fish, not so much. But then when you look at the angles, the situation gets reversed. Those copper sulfates, they don't really change their body angle a whole lot but the neomycin ones do. So we're starting to see differences in the treatment. So how you ablate the lateral line makes a difference for the downstream behavior. So there, each of these treatments uh, is got a specific effect on the behavioral profile. I don't really wanna call it a phenotype, but it's at least a behavioral profile in the animals. And then of course the angular variance in all these treatment animals gets reduced as well. This is kind of a complicated graph and I'll just sort of walk you through it really quick. So this gives you a relative, a change in the relative timing of these uh, of things. So for any particular change in a linear component, that's the dotted line right in the middle, you can start to see things like, does the animal tend to turn to the right? Do they tend to turn to the left? Does, the tame, does, the, um, does that sort of change in the angle, does that precede if it's on the left of the graph or does it come after? The change in linear movement. So if water flow comes, 
you're going to see that there's going to be some strong correlations between these linear and angular movements. The whole point of this graph here is to look at this is what the controls look like. If you start to add in the treatments, you see that the curve starts to change. And it's in, again, treatment specific manners. So the timing gets kind of wonky between the, the, the movements. So what we're really looking at is there's these change in timing that you would never really be able to parse out unless you use the machine learning. So this is just a cartoon version of how everything starts to shift. So these angular shifts, if you get rid of the lateral line, you actually start to delay changes in the angle. So they kind of just go crazy forward. And then it's, oops, I got to make a correction. So as opposed to the controls, which make their angular correction and then go forward. So there's a total shift in the behavior. So really, what do we see? So what is the lateral line and what does it do? Well, it does a lot of things. Again, it's kind of like a donut, I guess. <clears throat> But what we're seeing is that at least this is not entirely new, but now we've got some really great evidence that shows this, al whoops, this allows animals to hold their station. So they can still perform the behavior, but what they do is they have a minimum economy of movement. So it's like you're more effective in when you actually do respond to water flow if you've got a mechanism to actually detect the water flow. So this again allows them to hold their position with a minimum economy of movement. And what I really like about this is you can do almost anything. If you're creative enough, you can start to apply these techniques to almost anything. So genetic screening, pharmacological effects, tox ecotoxicology, whatever. We've exposed these animals to noise. Uh, so 60 Hertz noise will actually ablate those lateral line uh, neuromass, those hair cells, and it will change their behavior in a specific way that is different from these two treatments I just showed you. So it's really kind of cool. If you've got this behavioral model, you can start to infer what the damage is to the sensory system based on just the behavior of the organism. So we're gonna circle back to EMF because I actually have this little uh, wind farm uh, icon here because that's what's gonna bring me to what I plan on doing here. So you might be familiar, there is a facility called PacWave. So Pacific Wave, it's right off, it's between here and Waldport where there's an actual test site. So packwaveenergy.org, you can see what's going on. And it's right here. So here we are in Newport. And then if you go south, there's two sites, a north and a south site. The south site is being developed now. So these are just uh, images from their website. And what winds up happening is they're using wave energy converters, not wind, but wave. So they've got, they're, they're testing a variety of different designs. So here in the cartoon on the right, you'll see there's these sort of floating wave energy converters and then the power goes down to uh, collectors and substations. And they've actually, I think, already drilled. In fact, I know they've actually drilled into the bedrock to lay these four cables along the side here. Uh, and actually, they come up on shore. So if you go, if you drive down 101, you'll actually see, well, you can't really see it. It's a Driftwood State Park. <clears throat> but it's all kind of closed off because they're doing construction there. So we're looking at maybe five megawatts of cable and they're gonna operate, it should be operational in about a year and then they're gonna uh, test it to the grid, the, the electricity grid here in Oregon in two years. So they really, the question I wanna do is kind of like make a Franken monster, uh, Reese's peanut butter cup, whatever you wanna call it. I wanna bring these two things together and I wanna see like how do these EMFs, these electromagnetic fields that are generated how do they impact local fauna? So we're gonna use a local species that's electrically and magnetically sensitive, the long-nosed skate. And also we think, we think Dungeness crab might be, and this is its more natural and tasty state here, the crab cake. Um, we think that they might be electrically sensitive. We'd have some anecdotal evidence for it. We, there, there are arthropods that are magnetically sensitive. So lobsters, spiny lobsters, and some other crabs have been shown to use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. So, you know, and it's also a very lucrative fishery here. So it's really important stuff. And we need to know, are there gonna be any impacts to the local economies with fishermen, you know, their livelihoods? Is any of this stuff, you know, and just even not just the wildlife from an interesting biological question standpoint. So what are we gonna do real quickly here in the lab? What I'm trying to set up actually at the fish barn over here at NOAA is uh, kind of something, well, this is actually what the scenario might look like out in the wild. If you have a top-down view, you've got your, your your high voltage cable and these magnetic emissions that are radiating laterally outside of the cable. It's electrically shielded. Remember that it's electrically shielded, but magnetically it's not. You can't shield, well, 
it's tough to shield for that, let's put it that way. It's possible, but it's, it's not trivial. You've got your little crab here producing his bioelectric field. Remember, because all these animals are doing that. And then if you've got your laser right coming along, well, does any of this sort of stuff induce any electric fields around them that kind of make it confusing? And is he going to be able to find his lunch, his or her lunch? Uh, are they going to be able to navigate well when they go through this? Is it going to act like an electric dog fence, but maybe like a magnetic skate fence or something like that? We don't really know. Is it going to affect foraging? or navigation behaviors, neither, both. That's what we're here to start finding out. So we're gonna look in the lab or start in the lab. So again, over at the fish barn, we'll have a cable, have a few uh, non-energized cables because it's always good to give animals a choice because we're gonna do behavioral experiments. Um, and then again, here's the, you know those magnetic emissions, our little uh, long nose skate, and we're gonna do the machine learning stuff. So we're gonna video it and then we can start to mark those points and then quantify their behavior and generate this sort of curve of the behavior. So there's your sort of machine learning component. But eventually what we wanna do is take this out into the field, not just stay in the lab. So we have to do this stepwise sort of transitional or translational process. We're gonna put high resolution biologgers on them. So they're triaxial biologgers that look at acceleration of the animal. And it's also got a magnetometer on it, which is triaxial as well. So we want to, as the animal responds, either yay or nay, to one of these uh, 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 energized cables, is it attracted, is it repelled by it? We want to translate, what does the machine learning model look like? And then what does the biologger model look like? So we, have to, we can basically start to do this A equals B sort of thing. <clears throat> because eventually, like I said, we want to take this out in the field and we're not going to be able to, be, to video animals in the, in the wild. What it might look like in the field is that we're gonna do this stepwise process where now we've got the biologgers on the animals and this takes high resolution, short term data for maybe up to about a week. But we're also, again, we can't do the machine learning stuff, but we wanna put actually long-term monitoring. So Vemco uh, acoustic telemetry tags. And again, they are triaxial as well with a whole suite of sensors on them, also with a magnetometer. So we want to do another sort of step where we translate biologger data into long-term tag data. Because what we want to do is see if, if we can start to quantify, okay, when we get long-term tag data from these acoustic telemetry uh, tags, what does it actually look like? Can we start to backtrack and actually see how the animals respond to EMF noise in the field? Because that's really what matters. It's great that we can do stuff in the lab, but we wanna set a good precedent for what we're doing in the field so that we can all kind of talk together here and create some standardized methods that we can start to share with researchers around the globe as this uh, infrastructure gets more and more developed along our coastlines. So, there we go. So we wanna also be able to predict what these impacts are. So we've got the lab component, the field component, we've got some collaborators at New York at Stony Brook that are developing ecological models for like habitat suitability and, and, and distribution of species and all this other sort of stuff. But we wanna kind of pull all this together. We wanna to take the lab, the field and the ecological models and see, can we actually uh, assess and then predict how EMFs will uh, impact the, the movements and the distributions of species? Because that's really what matters. Is this going to, when we put, we have these proposed areas of lease or lease areas that they have proposed to lease for offshore wind development <clears throat> or energy development, how is that gonna impact these electrically and magnetically sensitive species? If we can start to predict this sort of stuff before it actually happens, then we can start to build in measures to mitigate it as opposed to trying to like, oh shit, after the fact, trying to fix things that we might've done. So that's at least the goal of this project and where I'd like to take it in the coming years. With that, I'd like to say thank you so much for your time, for coming, for taking a whole host of people. And I always have to give, you know, thanks to my cat, Walter. So now you all know Walter. I'm like one of those insufferable mothers who wants to show you pictures of their newborn. Although I do it with my cat because he's freaking adorable. So yes, this is Walter. And also on a personal note today, um, so yes, again, thanks to Sarah and, and Taylor and the Sea Grant for actually getting me here. But today, I actually, there's a podcast. I was on a podcast, my very first one. And so if you want to find it, it's actually the Save Our Seas podcast. 
And I was actually recently in a scientific, um, uh, American scientific thing. Anyways, it was uh, the father of electroreception recently died. And so I was interviewed for that. So if you enjoyed today's shenanigans, you can have some more at your own leisure. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate your patience and I'll take questions. Thank you. A great, what a great talk. Uh, do we have any questions from online or in the room? Okay, we got one on uh, in the room here. Yeah, thanks, it was really interesting. Thank you. Electromagnetic sens sen sensory processes are pretty widespread in the animal kingdom. You, have you got a list of what you think are the more sensitive and the less sensitive? Uh, and is the mechanism similar and the response likely to be similar? That's a really good question. Um, you know, it's so poorly studied because it's kind of like voodoo and a lot of hand wavy magic, or at least that's how it's, uh, at least that's, that's kind of how, because we don't have, it's cryptic in that sense that we don't have a natural thing. A lot of people don't study it. It's not well-funded. So there's just a handful of folks that have even studied this. The number of species, we, we really don't know. We kind of have to make a lot of inferences. There's only really been a few elasmobranchs and a few arthropods. I mean, it's kind of widespread in some in insects, we think. So to answer your question, the list is kind of tentative and it's rather short. And we kind of start to make assumptions based on relatedness, so taxonomic, uh, you know, sort of relatedness. Um, assuming that all elasmobranchs can do this. Now, the mechanism is a completely different thing that I blew past because it's kind of a Pandora's box in a can of worms. We think that with elasmobranchs, they could have one or two mechanisms for detecting it, that indirect sort of way of using your electroreceptors. It's called uh, magnetic field in, or electric induction. So as you move through a conductor and you apply a magnetic field, you generate an electric current and these animals are sensitive enough that they could actually detect that change in current due to their movement through a field. So there's that way. And then also what we think is maybe the more widespread is magnetite. So iron oxide particles that are deposited. We think in some animals it could be in the ethmoid region here. So in the nose, innervated by the, by the trigeminal nerve maybe. Um, and so, and then of course in birds, and other animals are just like cryptochrome. So there's this radical pair sort of thing. You get a photoreceptive or you know, molecule and it kicks an electron up and there's paramagnetic spin and then it comes back into its shell and all this other sort of stuff. So we don't know. Nobody's actually ever found. Well, okay, hold on. I was, I was gonna say nobody's really found a magnetoreceptor, but in that podcast, <laughs> I was on there with somebody else, who, uh, Jesse Granger at, at Duke. And she, was, she corrected me and I'm like, oh, damn, you're right. Magnetotactic bacteria. So little single cell organisms are actually, we can actually see the magnetite particles there. So we think that maybe something like that could be a receptor cell. But interestingly enough, since magnetic fields are ubiquitous and they penetrate everything except things like iron, receptor cells could be anywhere. It doesn't need to be, the stimulus, like your ear, you have the oracle here or the lens on your eye to focus the stimulus onto the receptor cells themselves. You don't need that. So it's like looking for a needle in a needle stack. We don't really know. And, and you know, protein expression is one way to kind of like start to, to back, you know, track it. So yeah, it's, it's pretty wide open. And so really good question. I don't know. And so, yeah, thanks for asking though. <laughs> I wish I did know. So uh, a question online from Beth. Mm -hmm. Please comment on different types of cables being used and differences in signals. That's a really good question too. So yeah, so the type, so all the EMF that's generated by the cables, yeah, it's, it's going to be, it depends on the composition of the cable and how much power is running through it. So a DC current cable. So sometimes, let's see, over long distances, they use direct current because it's a little more efficient or actually a lot more efficient. So that again, creates a constant sort of magnetic field stimulus. Um, but if you have over short distances, AC is actually preferred. So, and actually going from the wave energy converters down to the distribute, so the sort of the, the little hubs where everything gets 
uh, collected and then sort of redistributed and transformed maybe to DC. Sometimes they have three cores and those are out of phase with each other. So you get the sinusoidal current or, uh, you know, sort of back and forth, but then there's three that are right next to each other and they interact in some funny ways and they generate sort of these spinning magnetic fields and then that induces, so it's a really complicated thing. Um, we don't really, you know, and that's the thing is with this particular study that I'm starting, we're going to have to look at a wide variety of different scenarios because not everything is always the same, whether it oscillates at 50 Hertz or 60 Hertz, depending upon if you're here in the States or over in the UK. Um, and then of course the power and then power use fluctuates daily. Um, you know, is there more of a load being generated during a storm uh, versus maybe a quiet time? Or is there more uh, current being drawn during the day when maybe there's more air, of course, nobody has air conditioning here in Oregon, I guess, right? So other places like say Florida or the East Coast, there's gonna be a lot more load at certain times of day or even certain times of year. So again, it's kind of another big question that we really need to look at because it's not standardized across anything. Another question online? No, it's actually my own question. Um, and uh, it's a little bit sort of off target, but I can't help but ask you. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering in, in the experiments that you did when you basically researched whether they do respond to a stimulus mm -hmm. and then you, you showed us how they, they basically learn. This has to do with sort of communication of learning mechanisms. And I wonder whether you noticed that as you began to train individuals that other individuals that came after learned faster. Oh, that would be really interesting. Um, I didn't notice that because my sample size wasn't big enough to really test for that. It was literally just a handful of animals or a couple of handfuls of animals. And everybody was tested in isolation. So there was no social component to the learning. So it's been shown in a lab ranks that if you, so they can use tools like stingrays have been shown to use tools to get food. And basically the definition of it was they can actually, if you put a piece of shrimp in a, like a tube that's closed at one end, they can't really suck it out, but they can blow it out. So using water to kind of blow it out, they can actually get the food out. So that's considered tool use. Now, when you do that with an isolated individual, they have a certain learning component, but if you have another individual and they can actually observe them, they, those individuals that could observe somebody else doing it, they actually learn faster. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. We didn't have that because everybody was tested in isolation. They were housed in a separate housing tank or um, husbandry tank, but they were tested all in isolation. So we didn't have the sample size and I would doubt that it would really be a, an influence anyways, based on the study, the way the apparatus was set up. Question now. Okay, uh, one more question online and Oh, actually, we've got one actually in, in house. Can we just okay. ask that one? So, my understanding of the test site uh, between here and Walport, they've drilled beneath the ocean floor. They did. I assume that's to try and mitigate uh, electromagnetic effects. I think so, yeah. I wonder yeah. How, how deep is it deep enough? It, could they drill again if it's not? That's a really good question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's actually. That's so heat can become kind of an issue too. So when you've got it, when it doesn't get maybe cooled by the water, so that could be kind of an issue for them, at least, you know, maintaining it. The thought is begin because electric and magnetic fields decay fairly rapidly with, with distance. It's like this sort of cubic decay, decay in the strength of it. Um, the thought is that, you know, if you put it a few meters below that it probably is not going to have too much of an effect. We don't really know, because I don't know that anybody's actually gone out and actually surveyed that to see how that actually changes the local geomagnetic landscape at those where those cables are. Um, and then of course, if they're running a lot of current through it, that's gonna increase the signal as well. So I think that's one of the reasons they did that, or at least that's, that's potentially one of the things, but there's also a lot of stuff that if I can, um, there's also a lot of stuff that is actually exposed in the water that you can't, uh, let's see, let's go back, go back to the cartoon that they had. 
as you I have a lot of clicks here. There we are. So right there on the right, you see that, yeah, those cables, uh, what you're referring to are actually the ones on the right that are going back to shore. There's four cables there. But when you get out into the seafloor and you've got those eight, these, the ones that are coming from the wave energy converters, those are AC coming straight down to the substrate. And then they get sort of collected along that. So all of that stuff is gonna be exposed. So even though the cables that are running back to shore are shielded, housed, whatever you wanna call it, this other stuff is going to be actually exposed out there, and this could actually be an this could be an issue for pelagic animals as well. That's where where we could actually see some stuff. So, I think it actually could that could really help is if you bore it. The thing is, is this is also very close to shore. Some of these cables in other locations are like really really long, and they're probably not going to be bored, or they might dig a trench and then cover it and then bury it. So. You know, there's, those are some of the solutions that people have used, but it might not be some of the cables. Yes, it will be an issue. Some of them, not so much. We're, uh, we're actually running out of time and I, I do want to uh, let folks who, who may need to leave, uh, feel free to do that. Um, would you be willing to entertain uh, any further questions? Absolutely. And here, let me put, uh, if people have questions, they can always reach out to me. Uh, whatever sort of so uh yeah so i, I put I do. my info up there uh, oh i had it up there crap uh, it's on the, the front page i'll put it up there okay uh well so let's let's thank our speaker uh first off uh for giving a great talk oh thank you And I would encourage anyone, uh, if, you have, if you have a question, please come down and ask it directly. And uh, we'll also um, provide uh, Kyle's email uh, to ask questions for folks online. So thank you again. Let's see, where is it? Oh, there we are. Here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you.